You know who could kill you right now and most likely get away with it and would probably get the support of most of the news media? A cop. The average American, the most powerful person they will ever interact with is a local police officer because that officer, every single one of those officers, has the power to pull out a gun and kill them. Donald Trump couldn't do that. Joe Biden can't do that. Every single sworn American police officer has the right and the power to do that. The police form a foundational part of how the news functions in this country. Crime today is arguably the bedrock of news reporting. Without crime, without the police, it's hard to imagine what the bulk of the news at both the national and local levels would look like. If a program like Stop and Frisk is abandoned, will people die? Well, I, I think, no question about it, violent crime will go up. Just ahead on efforts by some big cities across the country to rein in aggressive police tactics while violent crime is on the rise. All this going on as police are facing tougher situations when responding to emergencies or even so much of our entertainment industry, which since the 1970s especially, has relied on the police and on the fear of crime and the morbid fascination with it to pull audiences in. And so as we find ourselves in the midst of another media zeitgeist about increasing crime, it begs the question, is all of this, the foundational nature of the police and crime in our news and entertainment industries, just a natural part of how this all works. That people just want to know what to watch out for and what criminals lurk in their neighborhoods. Or has all of this been by decades of design? Does our news coverage of crime and the police function in service of the institution of the police? Does it just simply fearmonger about crimes that have the smallest impact on the larger collective? And are we, in the process, allowing dishonest coverage to dictate the direction of policy that addresses crime in this country? I've said it before. The answer is not to defund our police departments. It's to fund our police and give them all the tools they need. Welcome to Backspace, where we tell you how the story is told in the headlines, and then we think about how we can tell it a little differently. Reverence of the police in this country is arguably exceptional. The American police, as lone officers and as an institution, receive a glorification that's almost on par, maybe in some cases more so, with that of the military. In the mind and the imagination of the average American, the police officer is the white knight, is the person in uniform who is here to maintain order, to protect, to save. Uh, they're the hero of the story. And that's an image and a reputation that's been burnished by decades going on centuries of popular culture and mass media portrayal, where we as Americans truly believe and want to believe in the police officer as the good guy. The bad guys don't stand a chance. That kind of respect, reverence, could be fine if it didn't give police unquestioned authority to dictate the terms of their own existence, their abuses, and the occurrence of crime in this country. And that's nowhere more apparent than in our news coverage, which reveres the authority of the institution of the police. We know you back the blue, but do you back the blue's budget? Former Mayor Rudy Giuliani increased the number of police officers by 20 percent. Crime and homicide rates dropped to record lows. He was able to do this in large part to government funding. When you have crime on the rise, you've got to do something to counter that. So the police tactics and things that the police have to do to bring the order back to it has to increase. Let us roll up our sleeves to roll back this awful tide of violence and reduce crime in our country. This type of reporting, which kowtows to the authority and power of the police, privileging police narratives about itself, its individual members, and about crime, has been referred to as... Copaganda. News that serves as PR or propaganda for police departments and the interests of the police. It's not just about how the police themselves are reported on, but also how crime, which crimes are reported on, who is used as a source, and what solutions are offered. 
I think there are really three main functions of propaganda. First is it's designed to make us panicked and f- afraid of all of the um, types of very particular crimes that police enforce. The second function of propaganda is once it narrowly constrains our our understanding of what is related to our safety, it narrowly constrains what we think of as threats to our our well being. Its role is to make us think that that those threats are constantly increasing. The third very important primary function of propaganda is it suggests that police, prosecutors, and prisons are the solution to that. So, what does it look like in day to day news coverage? It looks like the repetition of phrases like "officer involved shooting." An officer involved shooting. 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 Propaganda looks like using sources in a story that are either just the police or were once part of the police. It's one of the only genres of journalism in which we're totally fine with a single source, and we take that information and apply no pressure to it, despite the fact that we know. That police very often just get basic facts wrong, and if they talk to an expert, it's often someone who used to be a cop or used to be a prosecutor.、Um, sometimes they'll interview the corporate PR executives from, you know, Walgreens or CVS or something like that. But very, very rarely do they include critical perspectives. And if they do include critical perspectives, they'll be buried at the bottom of an article. There's also how victims of police violence are reported on versus the police perpetrators of that violence. With the most infamous example being the 2014 killing of 18-year-old Ferguson resident Michael Brown by former police officer Darren Wilson. Brown was routinely characterized as an aggressor, whereas Wilson was consistently humanized and presented as the victim. We can also look at how the police have been covered in the last two years since the George Floyd protest erupted in May 2020. There was an obsession with the slogan "Defund the Police," a summary of a policy meant to take funds from bloated police budgets and put them toward mental health and social work services. Instead, we got fear mongering about how anarchy would ensue, which, of course, led to the further bloating of police department budgets. Propaganda is also built on how crime itself is reported on, specifically. Which crimes are worth mentioning again and again, and which barely make a blip on the nightly news? Tonight, facing rising crime across the country, President Biden's under pressure to do more. Cities across the country are facing a dramatic rise in carjackings. I spoke with the police chief about his plans to address crime in 2022. I'm just curious: Is Eric Adams going to be able to do anything while he's obviously surrounded by elected officials who want New York to remain chaotic? Things like illegal eviction and illegal air and water pollution kill orders of magnitude more people. I mean, each of those things is associated with mass death in this country, particularly death of poor people. But but in the case of air and water pollution, death, cancer, illness, and injury at, at a massive scale. And you don't see daily beats where reporters are talking about、um, substandard living conditions, or workplace safety violations, or、um, companies spewing toxic things into the air or the water, which are actually killing people. None of those things mentioned by Alec register as crime in our minds, right? For most of us, air pollution isn't a crime; it's a nuisance. Maybe at worst, it's a bad policy. Undrinkable water isn't a crime, right? It sucks. It's horrible. But no one is currently sitting in prison for knowingly letting the residents of Flint, Michigan, drink water poisoned with lead. Tens of millions of Americans, rural, indigenous, black, poor, are drinking contaminated water, but that doesn't register in our collective minds as criminal. And that's because of how we've been conditioned to think of crime, specifically what the FBI calls index crimes. These eight crimes, which the FBI argues are the most common crimes, have annual data collected on them, meaning they're the ones we know and hear about the most. And so, crime like auto theft, homicide, rape. Is an individual occurrence. That's how we end up thinking about crime. We don't think about systems or infrastructures of finance, housing, public health when we think about crime. We don't think about detrimental policies that create conditions that lead to those smaller crimes. 
We don't think about how the crime we hear the most about is the crime committed mainly by those from disadvantaged communities when there's no shortage of it in richer and more powerful segments of American society. So why is this happening? Well, a large part of it is that institutions that command authority uphold other institutions that command authority. The media is collectively a power broker. Uh, we benefit from symbiotic relationships with other institutions. Uh, we have a vested interest, often in the success um, of those institutions. And, and so because of that, very often it undercuts the ability of the media to truly hold uh, police departments uh, accountable. In addition to the visceral respect for the authority held by the police institution by the media, there are also the concerted efforts by police departments to cultivate relationships in newsrooms and control narratives involving them. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, for example, has 42 full-time employees dedicated to manipulating the news and the media information. The Los Angeles Police Department has another 25 full-time cops devoted to manipulating the news and shaping narrative and working with journalists on stories. That's not even counting all the other cops in those bureaucracies who spend time doing media relations work and the outside contracts they have with PR firms. And they're far from alone. Police departments across the country have invested in public relations or media affairs departments, as well as strategizing for decades on how to better control media coverage. There was then an exchange of gunfire between the suspect and three Boise police officers were involved. Phoenix police saying officers gave several commands to Brown to drop the gun before he pointed the firearm at officers. He said he was a ninja and he was going to kill them. They tried to de-escalate the situation. He then began to move more quickly and lunge toward Officer Segura. And they shot at him when he lunged at them. The two individuals finally jumped out of the car. Uh, they ran off into the blocks. And fired a shot that hit a police vehicle. A scare at the mall that could have ended in tragedy. The suspect was arrested in custody and safe. Given the baked-in reverence the media has for government institutions, which includes the police, and given the amount of money police departments have put into controlling the narratives around themselves, is better coverage even possible? Is it possible to reform something so tightly sewn together, the media and the police? Let's start with the most obvious way, how we ourselves as consumers of the news can engage with police and crime stories. And that starts with considering why we're being told the specific stories we're being told and who's telling those stories. It's vital to understand when consuming news that there's certain stories that powerful people want us to know and there's certain stories that they don't want us to know. And, and everything else follows from that. Then consider the story itself the narrative that's being pushed forward, and how it aligns with what other sources tell us. For instance, so much national and local news coverage since 2020 in particular has focused on a, quote, rise in crime, yet ignored what may be an aggravating factor. Overall, crime is low. Yes, there's been a rise in violent crime, like homicide and aggravated assault, but it's also increasing at a slower rate. But coverage of crime tends to ignore and erase root causes of crime, specifically crimes committed within or by those from underprivileged neighborhoods. The main driver of crime, especially violent crime, is income inequality. It's poverty. It's also the criminalization of poverty. Rarely do newsrooms make the connection between rising crime rates and increasing poverty, or between rising crime rates and the sort of crimes that are primarily prosecuted, crimes that tend to focus on the wrongdoings of the poor. Newsrooms need to reprioritize their understanding and engagement with crime, not just the structural issues at the root of crime, which can be fixed, but also consider bad policies and bigger crimes that are creating conditions that generate smaller crimes. One of the things that we constantly see with the news is a portrayal of every problem as it has to find someone whose fault it is. It has to find someone to blame, someone who's a bad person, right? Instead of actually asking, how are these systems designed to inevitably lead to these outcomes? 
If all we're hearing is that crime is increasing and simultaneously that there's a war on the police by the so-called radical left, then the solutions offered won't be those rooted in fact, but emotion brought on by fear-mongering. And it then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Beyond re-examining how journalists engage with crime and how they deliver it in a very myopic way driven by class assumptions of what is noteworthy crime and what isn't, at the most basic level, newsrooms need to fact-check police narratives. The police are, to put it politely, far from an innocuous and objective bystander witnessing crime. They benefit from fear around crime. It means more funding. It means relevancy. Newsrooms, local and national, also need to re-examine their relationships with police departments. Public information officers are PR agents. Their job is to control the narrative, not to give objective facts. The police should not be at the center of the stories they are a part of. It's our job to try to figure out what's true and what is not. And so often things that American police say crumble under the lightest amount of scrutiny. Much like how it is difficult to reform the institution of the police, reverence for the institution and its authority by the media also faces a similar difficulty. There's an inextricable link there, a symbiotic relationship that feeds the other what the other needs. The news media needs attention-grabbing stories, and the police need the public case to constantly be kept around and empowered. But if, as journalists, we stumble when it comes to holding any institution of power accountable to the public, then what are we doing exactly? Because our current coverage of crime, of police, seems less like punching up to power and more like holding up the abuse of power. And scene. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. We do have a few more episodes left in this season of Backspace, and so we want to hear from you as to what you want us to cover. Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we will see you soon.